it's not something that's going to offend too many people, we thought. <laughs> Although it was, of all the issues we ever got involved with, nothing, no one, we never got more emotional anger directed at us under any other issue, whether it was abortion, taxation, anything we said about the war, uh, nothing came close to Sunday shopping. Sunday shopping. In 1888, a meeting of Baptists, Presbyterians, Methodists, and Anglicans led to the formation of the Lord's Day Alliance of Canada. In 1906, thanks largely to their efforts, a petition with 100,000 signatures was sent to the federal parliament in Ottawa. The result was a passing of new federal legislation called the Lord's Day Act. The Lord's Day Act prohibited the sale of any goods on a Sunday. However, no person could be prosecuted under the Act except with the express permission of the Attorney General of the province in which the person was conducting business. So, in the decades after the Lord's Day Act was passed, the Lord's Day Alliance lobbied the government to press charges against various offenders. The Lord's Day Alliance managed to have a man in Coburg charged for showing a motion picture on a Sunday. On another occasion, the Alliance prevented an international bowling competition from being completed because the final game would have run one half hour past midnight on a Saturday. In 1953, the City of Toronto declared an eight-day period to be Jerusalem Week. The purpose of the declaration was to assist in the sale of State of Israel bonds. The Alliance immediately objected, saying that the sale of the bonds during that period would break the law twice because the period contained two Sundays. On yet another occasion, the Alliance attempted to have Toronto market gardeners convicted for tending to their gardens on Sundays. However, the Lord's Day Act effectively permitted provinces to pass laws which would override the Act, and in 1975, the Progressive Conservative Government of Ontario passed the Retail Business Holidays Act, which, with some exemptions, prohibited most retail stores from conducting business on Sundays. The pretext for passing the law was that it would provide retail workers with a common day of pause, a purportedly secular purpose. However, the Lord's Day Act was already providing those workers with a common day of pause. The key difference was that, under the Retail Business Holidays Act, a person could be charged and convicted without the requirement of first getting leave from the Attorney General. If the police found a retail store open on a Sunday contrary to the Act, they could immediately lay a charge. And with increasing frequency, they did. Give me that old-time religion, give me that old-time religion, give me that old-time religion, it's good enough for me. It was good for the Hebrew children, it was good for the Hebrew children. However, in 1982, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms became law in Canada, and many retailers who did not observe the Christian Sabbath, or who did not want to, began opening their stores routinely on Sundays, fully expecting that they would be charged, but also expecting that the Lord's Day Act and the Retail Business Holidays Act would be found unconstitutional under the freedom of religion provision of the new Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Among those seeking to challenge the constitutional validity of the Retail Business Holidays Act were bookstore owner Edward Borens and furrier Paul Magder. In 1985, the Supreme Court of Canada struck down the Lord's Day Act, saying that the purpose of the Lord's Day Act was to compel people to observe a Christian Sabbath day. In 1986, Borens, Magder, and others challenged their convictions under the Retail Business Holidays Act at the Supreme Court of Canada level. It was well known that the Supreme Court of Canada was to deliver its decision on December 18, 1986, and it was widely expected that, as they had just one year earlier declared the Lord's Day Act unconstitutional, the Retail Business Holidays Act would suffer the same fate, and Sunday shopping would no longer be prohibited in Ontario. With that expectation in mind, many retail stores that had not been in the practice of opening on Sunday began opening on Sunday. The government reacted, and across Ontario, police began laying charges by the dozen. The opening of large grocery stores led to complaints by variety stores that because the big grocery stores were now violating the Act, their revenues were dropping. Large grocery stores and department stores argued that the government had failed to enforce the law against smaller stores and that they were losing millions of dollars on Sundays. If the law was to be enforced, they wanted it enforced against everybody equally. The left whipped up fears among retail workers that they would be forced to work on Sundays if the law were struck down. And of course, religious Christians called for the preservation of laws forcing everybody to observe Sundays as a day of rest. Freedom Party action director, publisher, and bookstore owner Mark Emery was well acquainted with the issue of the ban on Sunday shopping, having written about it in his Downtown London Metro Bulletin in 1982. Emery was not in the practice of opening his bookstore on Sundays, and he had no particular desire to do so, but a life-changing event was just about to happen. Seventh-day Adventists hold Saturdays, not Sundays, as their Sabbath day, and they had long opposed laws requiring stores to close on Sundays. 
Ray Monteith is an observant Seventh-day Adventist, and he was about to enter the doors of Freedom Party's headquarters with an idea. There were people in the Sunday shopping ports already, and the people having problems with Sunday shopping. It just never occurred to us that it was a big issue. There was a fellow in St. Thomas named Ray Monteith who came to London who happened to hear about Freedom Party. And he's heard about Freedom Party from a letter to the editor he read by a fellow named Gordon Mood, which wasn't even about that subject. It was about another subject entirely. I think it was about, a, about religion, actually. And Ray was a Seventh-day Adventist. So he came to uh, London and he, and he realized, you know, he started explaining to us, I never heard of a Seventh-day Adventist, and, you know, well, we, we have the Sabbath on Saturday. And I'm, oh, you're kidding. <laughs> That's the real Sabbath. Oh, you're kidding. <laughs> Having eyed Freedom Party's Never on a Sunday issue paper, which explained Freedom Party's opposition to Sunday closing laws, Monteith proposed distributing a large number of them at stores that were flouting the law on Sundays. He kind of suggested that might be a good campaign, and then when the idea was presented to Mark, well, that was just, oh my goodness, like Mark's birthday party when, when he found a, oh boy, something else I can break the law on, or something I can make a, make a, um, you know, make a point on. The issue paper had not been designed for the purposes Monteith had envisioned, so Freedom Party put together and distributed a new pamphlet entitled, It's Your Choice, Even on a Sunday. On December 7th and December 14th, at locations across Ontario, Freedom Party distributed the pamphlet and got the attention of the news media as a result. While collecting garbage during a strike may have been popular with some, the Freedom Party's stand in favor of Sunday shopping tends to be unpopular with many. Hello, here's a brochure supporting your right to shop on Sunday. No, and don't like it at all, it's bad. Well, what are you buying things for? In addition, Emery decided to open his bookstore along with other retailers across the province. I first opened my doors illegally on December 7th of last year, and though dozens of businesses within a few box blocks of my store were charged, mine wasn't. Now this was, you have to understand, this is a disappointment. Unlike everybody else, I wanted to get charged. And so I even had special sandwich boards on the sidewalk, huge five-foot sandwich boards. You cannot miss this. I'm right on the main street. And we had a big sign saying Lawbreaker Special, which, which featured a 20% savings on Sundays, an additional 5% off if you just got out of church. I couldn't help that day. And 10% more if you were present when we were being charged, which of course was our intent, and an additional 25% if you happened to be a police officer. And remarkably, that little 25% that little for police officers, the officers who did eventually come by asked if they could get it when they got off duty later on that day. On December 14, 1986, he was charged for violating the Retail Business Holidays Act for selling books on a Sunday. Four days later, the Supreme Court of Canada released its decision, and it caught everybody by surprise. In the news tonight, the Supreme Court of Canada upholds Ontario's restrictions on Sunday shopping. Dave Anderson reports. Paul Magger, the furrier from Toronto, owns one of the four stores that lost their cases today. He walked out of the crowded courtroom into a crowded corridor full of TV cameras and reporters. I was shocked. That's all. I was uh, very, very surprised. I, I couldn't believe it. It's a complex ruling and not all the judges agree, but basically the majority of judges found that Ontario's laws banning Sunday shopping are not based on religion. The majority ruled that the law only gives retail workers uniform holidays. The court also found that even though some religious merchants may be discriminated against, that discrimination is justifiable under the Constitution. I have on the line with me now Ron Logan, who is owner of Patton's Place Furniture Store. Ron, were you happy to, to hear this decision yesterday? Extremely happy. Uh, and our staff are happy because we really... We fought against it, quite frankly. Like we, we didn't want store opening in the first place on Sunday. We don't think it's necessary. And our biggest concern was the increase it would do in costs. There are still some of us who really do want to go to church on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. and, and as far as uh, the fines are concerned, uh, anybody who wishes to stay open on Sundays in defiance of the law, they know what the law is. I have no sympathy if they are charged the full fine. If it, it, It's the old saying, put your money where your big mouth is. Hi, what do you think? Should stores uh, who have broken the law be uh, face the full fine or what? The full fine and double it. And double it. Hi, what do you think should be done with these stores? Well, I think they should be fined sufficiently that they're going to feel the pain. You're not sure about $10,000, though? Well, it depends on the size of the store. I wouldn't want to see anybody go out of business for it, but, I mean, they are obviously breaking the law. They're, they're blatantly breaking the law. If they get the law changed by doing this, then 
what where's the end in sight? I mean, the lobby that wants to legalize marijuana might go and smoke dope on the Parliament steps. I mean, you know, if you really want to start getting laws changed by breaking them, I, I think it sets a very dangerous precedent. Are you with me, Ray? Yes, I am. I don't think anybody we elect should have the nerve to make laws that interfere with my rights or yours. Hi there, Lloyd. You're on the air. Yeah, good morning, Ann. Hi. I've been listening to this, and uh, I, I heard a caller, I guess it was Debbie, about five or six callers ago, made the statement that public opinion should have no influence on the courts. And I can't say that uh, I couldn't agree with her more, but I also have to say that I don't think public opinion should have any effect on the legislation either. And the thing is that legislation should not be based on public opinion. It should be based on the rights of individuals. And that's where the whole problem with respect for this law has uh, come up. Because everybody's talking about you should obey the law because it's the law. Well, the thing is, there's no respect for a law if that law doesn't respect the rights of individuals themselves. So specifically, what ought to be done with these people who, uh, who have been charged if they're found guilty? If I was in a jury, mm -hmm. I'd stand up and applaud for them standing up for their rights. After learning of the Supreme Court of Canada's decision, many of the retailers who had been flouting the law ceased to do so. The 31 Bay and Simpson stores in Ontario will remain closed on Sunday. Barry Agnew, the Vice President of Promotion and Sales, urges municipal and provincial governments to enforce the High Court decision to ensure that all stores do remain closed. At a news conference in Toronto today, Agnew said if the competition remains closed on Sunday, the Bay and Simpsons will conform to the law. However, if the competition opens its doors, Simpsons and the Bay will reevaluate their decision to close. And if we have to put a test case uh, back up to the, the court under Section 15 of the uh, Charter, uh, then we will do so. We will not tolerate a situation, as we told you before, where there is unfair economic uh, disadvantage in the marketplace. Edward Bournes gave up on the courts and turned his mind to a political angle. Magder continued to open his store on Sundays, fully expecting to challenge his convictions under the newly enacted equality provisions of the Charter. And on December 21, 1986, Emery too decided to open his store. However, Emery was not doing it to make money. He was doing it on principle. He posted a sign on his store saying that the first 200 customers to attend his store on Sunday, December 21st could have one or two books for free. By giving away books rather than selling them, Emery was able to make his motives clear. He was opening on Sunday not for any short-term personal gain, but because it was immoral for the government to prevent anyone from doing so. I am going to open this Sunday, and I have every intention of getting charged, and by no means whatsoever will I pay the fine I'm going to get. I intend to uh, go to jail. The government responded by charging him under the Retail Business Holidays Act. The government had played right into Emery's hands. London's best-known thorn in the side of the system is at it again. Bookstore owner Mark Emery, who was charged for opening Sunday, December 21st, has come up with a way to raise legal fees and protest the Sunday closing law at the same time. Even though Emery was only giving away books that Sunday, he was still charged for being open. Now he is selling t-shirts that read, I'm a criminal browser. My rule of thumb is with every bad law, try and make them pay. Try and make the government regret they ever passed a law that affected me like this. So what we're hoping to do is have, when people are wearing it, the uh, legislators and police officers and anybody who might see it who might be on the other side will have to, like, grin and bear it type of thing that we are making, uh, we are making publicity and headway with an issue that shouldn't have existed in the first place. Why is this law wrong in your estimation? Well, a good law is one that protects us from harm from criminals who would steal from us or, or give, us, give us harm. A bad law is one that restricts our personal choices in the way we live our own life without any real harm to others. And that's what this law does. It restricts my, uh, my choices without really any regard uh, to the, the benefits I may get from those choices. And I think I'm entitled to it. What will happen from here as far as your court appearances and uh, the legal process? Well, we're going to fight both charges, and, and if, if I'm found guilty and we don't appeal, as I promised, I'll serve a jail sentence before I cough up the money for a fine, and although ultimately I will have to pay the fine as well, but uh, hopefully we're, we're, we're looking forward to having better luck before a, a magistrate, and we hope to be found not guilty on both counts, ultimately. Emery has also ordered buttons with the caption, I love Sunday shopping. Those will be available at the City Lights Bookshop later this week, but never on a Sunday. 
Although the Supreme Court of Canada had upheld the Retail Business Holidays Act, it was widely understood that the real effect of its ruling was to put the Sunday shopping debate back into the hands of politicians. So, within weeks of the court's decision, the government struck a select committee on Sunday shopping, which began holding hearings across the province to determine what changes could be made to the law to make it more acceptable to all. Most of those who attended the hearings were religious groups seeking to ban Sunday shopping more consistently and thoroughly. And it was all conservatives and the religious right that was very, very... Well, but although the left supported the same laws, but for different reasons. They had their own reasons. And, uh, but the real anger came out of the right, and so the left let them do all the dirty work. But at the London hearings, two voices rose in opposition to Sunday closing laws. Those of Freedom Party President Robert Metz and bookstore owner Mark Emery. MPP Bob Mitchell said he was happy to see someone for Sunday shopping finally make a presentation to the committee. Here, the president of the London-based Freedom Party touted the benefits of Sunday shopping. In his presentation, Metz delivered a point-by-point -point refutation of the various arguments made by those in favour of forced Sunday closings, and explained that the essential issue is property rights. But Emery took a decidedly different approach in his presentation, and it got him on the front page of the Toronto Star and in newspapers across the country. Outspoken businessman Mark Emery has criticized the organized religions that oppose Sunday store openings as fools, liars, or hypocrites. Who among these Christians has not bought a newspaper on Sunday, or gone to a movie on a Sunday, or picked up something at a variety store on Sunday? Christians should be looking inward at themselves before they condemn an honest merchant offering honest values on Sunday. Mr. Emery is on the line. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Why are you blaming the churches for the Sunday closing law? Why them in particular? Well, I did more than blame them, you might say. I actually labeled them as, uh, amongst others, incidentally, including uh, business people, politicians, and labor organizations, I labeled them the real criminals in the Sunday closing legislation. What's criminal about it? Well, uh, you know, it's funny. I made the comparison uh, of how in business, you know, shoplifters are a problem, but they're only a problem once or twice, and they only do one thing, steal a few goods. But unfortunately, many of the organized churches and their parishioners are out to steal from me something much greater and steal from my consumers, and so that's the Ontario citizen at large. And there's, I claim they were stealing my time and my investment and my freedom of choice and all the fruits of my labor. And, and, and more insulting yet, they were enjoying their tax-free privilege at the expense of victims of their intolerance like me. I mean, my taxes help give the churches the benefit of their tax-free status, and I felt that was very sleazy of them. What would you like to see, Mr. Emery? How would you like to see... Well, I, I, I'm a believer in individual rights, and, and, and from those rights comes the responsibility of making your own decisions and yeah. paying the price of those decisions. So I would like to see it up to the uh, individual store owner or individual management of, uh, of big corporations, what have you, to determine what's in the best interest of that store. So I wonder if we could talk about the whole idea of you being robbed of your right to to be open, I gather, seven days a week. Is that what you really want? Uh, well, me personally, I don't particularly care. Um, I only, and I made a point of this, I said before the committee that I was proud to be a lawbreaker because I felt this law was wrong and unjust and that this was the only way to achieve justice in the matters by breaking the law and yep. bringing to the attention of people of Ontario how unjust it was. But the rest of the presenters were opposed to changing the law, the Catholic Women's League. In many cases, this could involve single-family parents having to work under these conditions, regardless of choice, thus causing further disintegration of the family. And the only other retailer to speak was from Marks and Spencer, who felt he couldn't afford to keep open seven days a week. The opposition to Sunday closing in this Liberal Party stronghold seems to have come largely from civil libertarians. The committee received no briefs from small businessmen here and say that even the Chamber of Commerce want to maintain the status quo and see the present law upheld. Of course, Emory was not the only person of note to be getting media attention for breaking the law against Sunday shopping. Since 1980, Paul Magder had been getting charged on an almost weekly basis. By the time of the committee hearings, he had already racked up almost 300 charges. To help draw attention to the issue, and help ensure that the issue did not get misperceived as merely an attempt by Emery to get personal attention, Met suggested that Freedom Party host a Magder dinner in Toronto. The dinner was planned for April 21, 1987, and Magder would be joined at the podium by Mark Emery and by the head of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Douglas Devenich. At the dinner, Robert Metz explained why Freedom Party and Emery opposed the ban on Sunday shopping. We're here to show our support to a man whose courage and conviction 
have led him to do quite a courageous thing, of all things, to break a law. Now, we don't normally go around supporting people who break laws or encourage it, but in some cases we have to make an exception. Paul Magder represents one such exception, and it's my job as president of Freedom Party to explain why this is so. That's what I'd like to deal with tonight, the issue. Sunday shopping isn't it. Freedom is. You see, it's not that principles and politics don't mix. It's simply that most political action and philosophy is based on principles that don't work. Every political action is based on principle. You just have to know what it is. Ever hear the saying, good in theory, but bad in practice? It's not true. It's another myth. Fact is, bad in practice, bad in theory. Using force is wrong. And because it's wrong, it never works. When it comes to the principles underlying freedom of choice and individual freedom, if there's one thing that I've learned, it's that you've got to discover them. You cannot invent them. You see, freedom is the real thing. And the principles on which it's, it rests are every bit as real as the principles behind the law of gravity. The principle at stake in any political debate essentially boils down to one choice. Do we want to live in a society based on the principles of consent, or do we want to live in a society based upon the principles of force? This choice is not open to compromise. Force and consent cannot be mixed. They're two opposite things. The head of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Dr. Douglas Devenich, objected to the religious motivations underlying the ban. I find it a violation of my basic humanity when I am required by the state to pay homage to an authority which I cannot concur in in my belief system. And Mark Emery explained how, by violating the law in the right way, he was able to bring attention to the essential principle he was advocating. And I must admit that I'm absolutely 100% thrilled to be a lawbreaker in the company of Paul Magdur. I'm proud of breaking the law. It's not because I broke the law. It's because I opened my store on principle. I took an action. I do not regard myself as having done anything negative. The principle that peaceful, honest people in a supposedly free nation do have rights, that's what I was exercising, and that these rights can only continue to exist and be exercised as long as just a few individuals continue to exercise them in the face of bad laws and political persecution. We cannot count on governments or the judiciary to keep Canada free. The government of Canada has never given you anything like freedom. They have never offered you a law that gave you more freedom. They have only taken it away. The only source of our freedom is those individuals who put principle ahead of convenience, who put, yes, in this instance especially, who put principle over profit and who know the difference between right and wrong, and who act accordingly regardless of the prohibitions of the day. Those are the people who keep you free. And so always be aware of that. You may vote at elections, but it is the Paul Magders and people like him who give you what you celebrate when you think of a free society. Because the only morally justifiable reason to break on, this is very important, and I'm going to return to frequently, is because it violates the peaceful and honest exercise of individual rights. There are no other reasons to flagrantly violate a law. But up until then, all the businesses in my community, and this is very tragic, too, I'd, and I was seeing this, everybody who is, quote, flouting the law, were telling the media, and I've got some quotes, there are several like this, quote, it's obvious people want Sunday shopping. This was what they were telling us was a reason to break the law. Or this one. The cash register has never stopped ringing. It's obvious that the majority of Ontario shoppers want Sunday shopping. Now, implicit in that message to the public, I mean, everybody's watching that, is the belief that it's okay to break the law if, A, the majority wants it, B, if you can make money at it, or C, if you have a desire waiting to be fulfilled, then those are reasons to break the law. And this is bad news by any definition of the term. The explanations were the worst possible offered for breaking the law. These were the very same non-philosophical justifications that are used to keep the Sunday closing laws intact. The exact same things I saw merchants using were the same things the other side was coming back. Numbers support that we need a Sunday for a day of rest. 
people want a pause day in their life. People, this is, so they were being negated. And it, it was a very large philosophical vacuum in my community of London. It was being subverted because actually these people were putting money over principles. So even though money was more important to them in the short term, it was the ideal thing that would be lost to them in the long term unless they understand principles. Uh, but we have become more or less the exclusive source on the Sunday shopping issue. And we are able to monopolize the philosophical position, at least the right one, from the issue of freedom of choice. And that was my intention, so to that degree it was a great success. In a sometimes humorous speech, Paul Magder explained how the law interfered with his freedom to conduct business. You know, the government talks about tradition, you know, the traditional pause day of Sunday and everything. I don't know, there's a few people probably old enough in this room to remember, what was a traditional shopping day? Remember the traditional shopping day, the day after Christmas? It was Boxing Day. That was like a family tradition. So what happens? They take away that tradition from us. Now, why did they take it away? It's very interesting. Because the large uh, departmental stores were having a hard time getting people to work Christmas time because they need a backup day to change their signs and get their sales ready and everything else for Boxing Day. So, so they had to make people work Christmas Day or get people to work Christmas Day, and it was very difficult for them to do so. So what they did is they got hold of the politicians, and somehow, I don't know what Boxing Day has to do with religion. It doesn't have anything to do with religion as far as I know it doesn't. Whatever religion you are, you know. <laughs> anyway, it's a tradition, mind you. Anyway, they uh, they got hold of the politicians and made it illegal to be open Boxing Day. Now, if you go into Eaton's or Simpson's or the Bay on Boxing Day, you will see many people working, not retailing, legally working to prepare for the next day. Now, this is wrong and this is unfair. So I decided to open Boxing Day. Open Boxing Day. My God, were we busy. It was unbelievable. And I was very nervous. Uh, the phone rings, and the voice says, Don't you know you're not supposed to be open today? Like that, you know, this bureaucrat. So I says, Well, well, well why are you working today? <laughs> <laughs> and didn't answer me, of course. <laughs> the sad part about this whole issue, the issue is not Sunday shopping. It's, 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 it's the charter rights. Does it really mean anything? And I, I'm beginning to wonder. I'd like to ask Pierre Elliott Trudeau that. Does the charter really mean anything, or was this just, uh, uh, you know, uh, just, just something to keep the voters happy, to fool us, to put, put blind blindfolds on us? You know? I don't know. I wonder. And Freedom Party presented Magder with a plaque in admiration of his efforts to end the ban on Sunday shopping. So we are here. We have to Paul Mag, a champion of individual freedom in recognition of his fight for freedom of choice, even on a Sunday. The dinner got the attention of Canada's national government-owned broadcaster, the CBC. The London-based Freedom Party held court in a Toronto meeting looking for support. Don't be surprised if you haven't heard of the Freedom Party. There are only about 200 members across Ontario, but they're planning to field as many as 10 candidates in the next provincial election. Their political message, keep government out of the lives of the individual. Thousands of years now, we have earned our freedom piece by piece because individuals buck the system. Not surprising, the Freedom Party sells Ayn Rand novels at their meeting. Rand's the literary champion of the individual. And not surprising, they invited Paul Madger, the one-man crusade for Sunday shopping to their meeting. I think Paul Mander's a hero. They agree with me on my fight for the free choice in Sunday shopping. And I think it's very nice that so many people have come out because they believe in what I'm doing and they support me. And uh, I think this is a way, one of the ways we'll get these laws changed. So Paul Magder has some new friends and some new support. He says he'll need it. Next week, he launches yet another court challenge to the Sunday shopping laws, and the Freedom Party will be behind him all the way. In the months that followed, the Ontario legislature debated a private member's bill that would exempt small bookstores like Emory's and allow them to open on Sundays. Private member's bills rarely are ever passed into law, and in this case, the bill was introduced not by a member of the governing Liberal Party, but by a Conservative MPP. Under normal circumstances, the bill would have been destined for the waste bin, However, two facts would ensure that this bill would become law. 
First, a local Toronto television station wired up fellow bookstore owner Edward Borens with a hidden video camera so that it could show how the Sunday shopping law allowed people to purchase raunchy pornography on Sunday, but prohibited Borens from opening his bookstore to sell non-pornographic books to the public on Sundays. After the video was broadcast on the local news, the Premier's phone rang off the hook with complaints. Second, Ontario's Premier David Peterson was a London-area MPP. Voters in Peterson's London riding were quite aware of Mark Emery and his efforts to open his bookstore on Sunday. Some voters were angered that Emery had been charged for giving away books on Sunday before Christmas. Some voters laughed at Peterson as Emery mocked him with his I am a criminal browser t-shirts. As Emery's Sunday shopping campaign continued to get attention, Peterson's prospects for re-election were threatened, and there can be little doubt that Peterson had considered it politically wise to pass the private member's bill into law so that Emery could no longer complain about being prohibited from opening his bookstore on Sundays. Mark Emery, owner of City Lights Bookstore and a vocal critic of forced Sunday closures, tells News 98 he doesn't want any favoritism. I agree on the face of it, it would be nice to be able to open my store on Sundays, and I'm certainly all in favor of that, but only if everybody else in Canada is accorded the same opportunity, and otherwise I'm completely opposed to letting bookstores open on Sunday if we're to be treated as a special privileged class. Emery says the government is just playing politics by buying off the booksellers. You'd think that Mark Emery would be happy with a new law that would benefit his business, but he's not. Mark Emery is the owner of City Lights Bookstore in London. Tomorrow, a bill is expected to pass that <clears throat> excuse me, would allow small bookstores the right to open on Sundays. Mark Emery joins us this morning. Good morning. Good morning. This bill will allow bookstores smaller than 2,400 square feet to stay open on Sundays. Yours fits that description. That's right. But you're not happy. Why? And I just feel that's wrong. The only reason we ever opened was to break the law in the first place to prove our point that the law should be abolished. And instead, what I'm getting is a special privilege that I've opposed all my, you know, adult life in this kind of situation, especially regarding Sunday closing. All right, but here you have a golden opportunity to make some money on a Sunday, which I would imagine was part of your intent in the first place, was it not? Oh, God, no, no. We made, we, we made maybe 50 to to $100 a day and are facing legal fees of $4,000 and fines of $1,000. In 25 words or less, what kind of law would you like to see? One without square foot restrictions? Oh, I would see one that says all citizens of Canada are equal and have the opportunity to decide for themselves whether to shop on Sunday, whether to open on Sunday. And that, to me, is the appropriate response of any government in a free society. What if this new law comes to be? What will that do to your legal problems? Well, it's going to irritate me because it's going to take what I had considered a serious means of protest. You know, we have announced to the press, we're going to court shortly, that, you know, when it comes down that we're found guilty, I'm going to go to jail over these charges, and I'm, you know, before I pay the fine, and I was planning to do this on a consistent, never-ending basis until the law was changed. Now that I'll be allowed to open, my only alternative, I guess, is to get a rack of clothing or something and put it in front of my store and make sure I have something illegal for sale on Sunday. To me, the best way to change a bad law, believe it or not, when it's immoral and takes away people's individual choice is to break it, if only to draw attention to the public of what a bad law it is. In June of 1987, the exemption for bookstores passed into law. Edward Bournes rejoiced at the news of the exemption for bookstores, exclaiming that his faith in the system had been restored. Emery, however, was not happy in the least. Yeah, when Mark would make inroads on his issue, they would start making exceptions for him, and so they accepted bookstores from, from uh, Sunday shopping, and that wasn't good enough for Mark. I broke that law every way one day. I gave books away free before Christmas. That was so absurd. People that immediately got people's sympathy. I gave away two thousand dollars worth of books free on the day before Christmas because I knew that was against the law, and I knew it was shockingly bad to the government to have a law that punishes someone for giving books away for free. And then I had four employees. Determined to continue his fight against the violation of property rights, Emery found a new way to violate the Sunday shopping ban and to demonstrate just how wrong and impractical the ban was. The exemption for bookstores only applied to stores having three or fewer employees working on a Sunday. So, to violate the ban, Emery scheduled four employees to work on Sunday and notified the police that he would be doing so. As a result, he was again charged for violating the ban on Sunday shopping. The man who started the party in 1984 says its philosophy is simple. We think that governments should be there preventing some people from imposing their will on others, rather than the reverse. I mean, it's fine if I don't want to go shopping on Sunday, but I don't have the right in a free society to force you to have to comply to what I want to do. That philosophy is applied to a number of issues. High on the list this campaign, Sunday shopping. The party says individuals should have the freedom to choose when and where they shop. 
The issue has attracted the son of Sunday shopping advocate Paul Magder to run as a Freedom Party candidate. Many other uh, religious groups uh, who do not observe the same day uh, as a Sabbath, and it should be the per you know the individual who decides which day are days they are not you know they do not want to work or that they do want to work. On free trade, the party wants a deal with the United States as soon as possible, and it wants trade barriers between the provinces removed. A pro-freedom platform means they're against censorship laws, against Sunday closing laws, and against most labor legislation, but emphatically for free trade. Obviously not a quick ticket to Queen's Park. Public discontent continued to grow, and by the end of 1987, the Liberal government had decided to introduce legislation that would allow each municipality to decide whether to allow Sunday shopping within their respective towns. Many businesses somehow continued to believe that their profits would decrease if Sunday shopping were allowed, so in January and February of 1988, they spent tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands, buying full-page ads in major daily newspapers. But in a sea of ads calling for the government to strengthen the ban of Sunday shopping, only one political voice could be seen to be calling for the opposite. Freedom Party ran full-page ads saying yes to Sunday shopping. In February of 1988, Emery was convicted on the charge of having employed too many people on a Sunday and sentenced to pay a $500 fine, which he had already refused to pay. The conviction did not deter Emery. In the weeks that followed, Emery took on the role of campaign manager for Freedom Party's candidate in the 1988 London by-election, Barry Malcolm. With Malcolm, Emery and Freedom Party kept the Sunday shopping issue front and center. Sunday shopping is more than just a single issue. Hello. I'm Barry Malcolm, your Freedom Party candidate in London North. If you support individual choice, self-responsibility, free enterprise, private property, and laws that apply equally to all, then you've got five great reasons to support freedom of choice in Sunday shopping, and five great reasons to support Freedom Party. Make freedom of choice your choice now. On March 31st, vote Barry Malcolm. This has been a paid political announcement. In March of 1988, Emery finally went to trial for his earlier, December 1986 charges, including the charge for having given away books for free. The judge dismissed the case before allowing Emery even to speak a word. However, Emery had still not paid his $500 fine for the February 1988 conviction of having employed too many people on a Sunday. Having refused to pay the $500 fine, the police arrested Emery on June 7, 1988, and threw him in jail. Me, that was why he went to jail. He didn't actually go to jail for breaking a Sunday opening law, but for employing too many people on a Sunday. And uh, that's the kind of country we live in. <laughs> Employment is a crime. He's probably, I think, still the only person in Ontario to ever have gone to, to jail for a Sunday shopping charge. And uh, what he wanted to do by that was to demonstrate to the public how draconian a law like this will ultimately be if someone wants to exercise what he felt, felt was their legitimate right to their own property and which I agree with. And so, you know, everybody would always challenge him and say, oh, no, you, nobody would ever go to jail over Sunday shopping. And he just said, oh, yeah, and so he proved the point. I wasn't there for the arrest. They sort of, the police gave him notice when they were going to come and pick him up kind of thing. And I uh, don't recall if they picked him up at the store or at his house. I don't think I was there right at that time. I know he went to jail and he called me a couple of times from jail and uh, we were collecting pennies for principals and he, the idea was he wasn't going to pay that fine to get out of jail so he was going to let his customers put money in a jar in the store and once it got up to be enough money to get him out then I'd take the money down to the jail cell and get in, and buy him out and I did that about four days later roughly give or take and um, showed up at the jail some, something like 6.30, 7 in the morning whenever they opened the doors and took my money in. It was really weird going in to buy a, to buy a criminal out of the jail system, right? Hi, I'm here to buy Mark Emery. Like one, please. <laughs> and they gave me one. <laughs> so out he came. <laughs> and uh, the amazing thing is the newspapers hardly covered it. It made a little article like this. In 1989, the Liberal government of David Peterson passed into law its bill, leaving it up to each municipality to decide whether the retail businesses within its jurisdiction could open on Sundays. The change to the law satisfied nobody. Though he was no longer violating the Sunday shopping law, 
Emery remained outspoken about the ban on Sunday shopping. Well, I mean, you've I'm been the one, Mr. Novak to this entire show about you're the man that represents the maverick in society, you're the, you're the man that represents the, the business community. You do not represent them, and you unfortunately do not represent the poor people that have to work out there for minimum they wage. They work for me. And they're the people that are going to suffer across this province. And this is amazing. I'm the person that pays these people. Without me, they don't have a job. With you, they could still be employed. If you disappear tomorrow, no jobs are going to dry up. With me gone, they dry up. Unless I don't have the ability to meet the consumers on my terms, those jobs don't exist. And I resent you saying that somehow you help people. You well, don't. As the Ontario provincial election of 1990 approached, the governing Liberals were rightly portrayed as having been too cowardly to take on a province-wide stand on the Sunday shopping issue. Though, in reality, the Progressive Conservatives similarly tried to straddle the line. Both parties saw that public opinion was shifting in favour of the wide-open Sunday shopping that Emory and Freedom Party had long been advocating. In contrast, the New Democratic Party, which Emory had supported a decade earlier, campaigned vociferously in favor of imposing a strict province-wide ban on Sunday shopping. Emory decided against running for office in the 1990 provincial election, but Metz and others nonetheless used the opportunity to campaign for individual rights and to keep up the pressure against the ban on Sunday retailing. Fundamentally, we believe that the purpose of a government in a free society is to protect the individual's freedom of choice and not to restrict it. Yes, we fundamentally support freedom of choice in Sunday shopping. On June 3, 1992, Ontario's Premier, Bob Ray, who had campaigned in 1990 on imposing a tougher ban on Sunday shopping, announced that he was repealing the Sunday shopping ban altogether. By June of 1992, 68% of people in Ontario were in favour of Sunday shopping. Ray explained that he had to recognise the fact that the culture, opinions and attitudes of the populace had changed. 